Thank you very much indeed. And um, seeing the presence of mobile phones uh, around uh, reminds me of um, a service I was uh, doing the other night. Usually I have a rather dry style as, um, as a spiritual teacher, but on this occasion I thought I'd better be a bit, a bit more punchy and engaged. So I said to the candidates for confirmation, tonight I said, Jesus Christ is putting through a special call to you. <laughs> and at that very moment, somebody's mobile phone went off. <laughs> and there was pandemonium. But um, it proved to be at the bottom of a hold all the dirty washing and we didn't get to it before whoever it was went on. Mm. Salam alaikum, shalom, beloved peace be with you. It's a very great privilege to have been invited to participate in this uh, conference uh, under the aegis of uh, Fatima. My experience, uh, along with my friends here, and especially through the work of the St. Ethelberger Centre for Reconciliation and Peace in the City of London, which involves representatives of all the religions who in their different ways look back to Abraham as their ancestor in the faith, that experience suggests that we can be and that we are natural allies in the search for a peace which goes beyond, and this echoes something that Mark was saying, which goes beyond the absence of conflict and points to that wholeness which is God's will for the world. On Saturday morning, I was in St. Martin in the Fields, just on the outskirts of Trafalgar Square, with Muslim friends, fortified by the assurance of prayer from Jewish friends who were, of course, celebrating Shabbat. And we were inaugurating 100 days of Olympic truce uh, by preparing ourselves to be more daring peacemakers because as uh, the great saint Seraphim of Sarov said, one person with peace in their hearts is able to convert the countryside for miles around. And it's a very common experience, however, that where there's a great deal of talk about peace, very often you discover extremely angry people. And the reality is that it's only when peace has come to dwell with some fullness and some authenticity within that we can communicate peacefully. The ancient Olympic Games, where we were thinking about the Olympic truce, were of course themselves, like Wembley Stadium and Westminster Abbey, rolled into one. Uh, religion and sport were bound up together. But I think it's very interesting that um, the languages that we look back to as those who are children of Abraham have a very different sense of peace than the languages spoken at the ancient Olympic Games. Irini, uh, and then later the Latin word pax, this suggests a pause, an interval, a truce, and it suggests that the natural state is one of war and conflict. That's the mental furniture behind those words. By contrast, for us, uh, as Mark has already said, our concept of peace, uh, which comes from the sacred scriptures, uh, which is derived from that ancient Hebrew word for wholeness, our concept of peace goes well beyond the interval between what is the natural state, the state of war and conflict, and points to the fact that we have a very different vision. And our vision as children of Abraham is that peace is the natural state. Uh, peace is what human beings were intended by God to enjoy. And in the biblical vision, there's a sense of peace at the beginning, and there is a vision of peace at the end time in history's consummation. And it implies that human nature in its truest form is peaceable. Human life is fulfilled in peace. War is not our natural state, but rather comes from the corruption of human nature. And fascinatingly, this is a very different understanding of what is the natural order from the understanding which is conveyed 
by those uh, words in ancient Greek and ancient Latin. This is a very different vision. Well, to turn more specifically to, and I have very much to say to you, but you cannot bear it now, quite frankly, and we've got uh, some very fascinating speeches, so I'm not going to uh, delay you um, unconscionably. But I turn to the witness of women of peace, and I've been tasked by the organisers to present the witness of Christian women in particular, but I really want to begin with what has been one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had in my life. And that experience was uh, a St. Ethelberger's occasion when a Jewish mother spoke of her agony after the death of her son, a schoolboy killed by a suicide bomber. And side by side with her, a Palestinian mother described the suffering which followed her son's murder by a sniper. Long ago, the prophet denounced talk about peace, peace, where there is no peace. But the witness of those two women who had achieved a costly reconciliation through their suffering was transformative for everybody who listened to them. If we look very briefly at the list of women who won the Nobel Peace Prize, it's very striking just how many of that amazing group were moved to do what they did by faith. In Northern Ireland, for example, a country I know well, as I expect many people here do as well, the two founders of the peace movement were awarded the Peace Prize in 1976. They were Betty Williams and Mary Corrigan. Both moved by a strong Christian faith, but with a complex interlap. I mean, Betty Williams had a Protestant father, a Catholic mother, and a Jewish grandfather. She was um, uh, one of the most daring, active peacemakers who eventually, and that's a great sign of hope, brought that ghastly situation where conflict fueled by religious animosities which had become tribal actually seem to be beyond resolution. But that is not the case. Uh, the role of faith in bringing an end to that dreadful story of victims and martyrs breeding victims and martyrs so that one couldn't quite see how it could ever stop. That was an amazingly strong piece of evidence. The role of women inspired by the faith uh, which um, certainly animated them in their work. I just want to end with perhaps words of the three most recent recipients, women recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize, where we find perhaps the clearest expression of the vital role of faith. From South America, well, Central America, Guatemala, the prize winner of 1992, Rigoberta Menchu, born in a village of indigenous people in a province far away from the capital. And she described how indigenous people like her identified with the sufferings of Christ in times of hardship. She said, with Christ crucified, Christ attacked with stones, Christ dragged along the ground, one felt the pain of that Christ and identified with it and it was this which in the end enabled them to persevere in the hope and the faith that their world could be still transformed. And then only last year we had a trio of religious women given the Nobel Peace Prize, including the 24th President of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a committed Methodist, as well as Tabakol Karman, a Muslim woman, from the Yemen. She's someone, I think, who ought to be um, a great inspiration to us, notable uh, in her leadership in the affairs of that country. And then Lema Bowie, a Lutheran from Liberia, who was awarded the prize for uniting Christian and Muslim women against her country's warlords. 
And as she told students in 2009, I didn't get there by myself or anything I did as an individual. It was by the grace and mercy of God. He has held my hands in the most difficult of times. He has been there. They have this song in my country, Order my steps in your ways, dear Lord, and every day as I wake up, that is my prayer, because there is no way that anyone can take this journey as a peace builder, as an agent of change in your community without having a sense of faith. And as I continue this journey in this life, I remind myself, all that I am and all that I hope to be is because of God. Now these extraordinary women are just a few of the multitude that daily make our world a better place. And it's important to remind ourselves in a world that doesn't always want to hear it, that it is their religious perspective that has impelled them forward in the context of hope. Hope for a world transformed and hope for a world redeemed when all shall live in peace. The prophet Isaiah said long ago, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spoons into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with a very full heart, I'm grateful to be sharing in this work under the aegis of battle. very much, uh, the Bishop of London, for the wonderful examples of women can use faith to promote peace and relating that to Sayyidah Fatima. Thank you very much indeed.